Hi, I'm Ed Marzell, president of Conexus, and I'd like to welcome you to this encore performance of a presentation that I gave in Sochi in Russia at the Kaspersky ICS Cybersecurity Conference. The topic is Security PHA Review, or SPUR. A little bit of background, I am the president and CEO of Conexus. I have been doing functional safety, looking at uh, industrial control systems being used as safeguards for over 25 years now. I am the author of the award-winning Systematic SIL Selection book from ISA and also the new Security PHA Review book from ISA, which should be released late in 2018 or possibly early in 2019, depending on how quickly the editors can get through their material. Um, I am a member of ISA 84, the, the standards panel, and a former director of the ISA Safety Division. And once upon a time, I uh, received a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from the Ohio State University. So uh, by way of introduction, um, cybersecurity is a topic that's gaining a lot more mind share recently uh, as attacks have been successful uh, in actually causing physical damage to process facilities. And as a functional safety engineer and as a chemical engineer, I want to make sure that that's not possible using the tools that we have in our uh toolbox uh, as opposed to strictly looking at cybersecurity mechanisms. So we're going to look at cybersecurity, but we're also going to look at traditional means of safeguarding that might obviate some of the need for the cybersecurity. Now, when you're designing cybersecurity, you need to consider the risk of the process. And this is an area where a lot of things have been done wrong. There's been a lot of focus in cybersecurity when risk analysis is done on looking at the industrial control system equipment. Well, failure modes in the equipment aren't going to tell you what goes on in the process. So we need tools and methods that are going to help us focus on the process. Um, and when you only focus on the SIS equipment, there are a lot of problems that result, like a poor definition of what accident scenarios are possible, uh, infinite potential outcomes. If you have the possibility of a man in the middle attack on your historian machine, for instance, what can happen? Well, literally anything can happen. Uh, and your uh, cyber has op, your CHAS op, your cyber PHAs really don't get into that, where your existing has op documentation can do a very good job of it. Also, focusing on the ICS equipment prevents you from considering inherent safety. Uh, and inherent safety is a big issue. It is the best way to make your plant safe. So we want to make sure that our methods can focus on that. I'm going to go out on a limb here and tell you that a well-designed process plant does not need cybersecurity, does not need cybersecurity to prevent a catastrophic loss of containment. Think about that for a second. And, and the reality is there are a lot of existing mechanical safeguards that can and should be used to prevent these catastrophic uh, loss of containment events. Now, a cyber attack is always going to be able to shut your plant down. But what we really want to focus on is making sure that it can't result in that big loss of containment event. Now, when we use a spur or a security PHA review, that's going to help us to identify what process scenarios that a cyber attack might be able to take advantage of to cause a loss of containment. And when we identify what those scenarios are, we want to make sure that we've either assigned the appropriate amount of cyber safeguarding through an IEC 62443 security level, or we can make the plant inherently safe against cyber attack by proposing inherently safe against cyber attack safeguards, mechanical systems. Now, this is my opinion of the current state of cybersecurity and why I'm so focused on making sure that the HSE groups, the safety groups, the process groups are involved in the process to make sure that cyber attacks can't cause loss of containment events. 
Uh, for those of you who are of my age, you may remember when media was delivered to you on paper uh, through the post system. And there was a thing called Mad Magazine that had Spy vs. Spy. And I loved Spy vs. Spy. So, uh, But basically, you look at it and you've got one guy in a white hat and you've got one guy in a black hat. And essentially... Other than that, they're exactly the same. And uh, the white hat is throwing bombs at the black hat, and the black hat is throwing bombs at the white hat. And there's a lot of activity and a lot of explosions and a lot of things happening. But at the end of the day, nothing successful is usually accomplished. Um, so what, what I want to have happen is a, a little bit of, you know, focus on the process side of things. I want to make sure that uh, if all of the cybersecurity fails, we're going to still be able to prevent a loss of containment event. Now, I'm going to go through everything in this example of Spur using an oil pumping station. So this figure here, you see a typical uh, oil pumping station on a pipeline. And, and what we're doing is to get oil from point A to point B, uh, we need periodically to be able to increase the pressure that is lost through line friction by increasing the pressure again with a pump. So you'll see here that this pump station has two centrifugal pumps. And what I want you to really focus on is look at the distance between the discharge of the pump and the discharge is going to be the top of the pump and the next isolation valve. It's only a couple, three meters. That's gonna come back up later uh, in the discussion. And the reason that I wanted to talk about a pump station is because a pump station was the target of one of the attacks that actually caused physical damage uh, through, through cyber mechanisms. So let's look at a schematic of a typical pump station. I'm not going to go into the details of the actual cyber attack that caused loss of containment. I'm going to speak in generic. So what you hear, see here is a typical pump station. You've got an incoming pipeline. You may have an oil surge tank uh, that helps it maintaining a consistent flow through the through the system, uh, kind of smooth out any inconsistencies. Uh, and then you have the pump itself. Now, you'll usually have automatic valves on the inlet and the outlet of the booster pump because pumps have seals. Seals can leak, and if a seal leak occurs and the, uh, the leak catches on fire, you want to be able to isolate that pump from the pipeline so that the fire can be maintained, it can be managed, it can be put out. Because if you don't have a means of isolating the pump from its source of inventory of fuel, you could have a very massive, very long-term fire. So usually there are valves upstream and downstream of the pump, and many times these valves are gonna be automatically controlled so that you can perform the shut-in remotely, or even if you do it with a push button near the pump itself, you wanna make sure that you're a sufficient distance away from the fire when you activate uh, the command to cause the the, the valves to go closed. In this case, we also have a safety instrumented function where uh, the discharge of the pump is, the, the pressure on the discharge of the pump is measured, and if the pressure gets too high, you're going to stop the pump. Well, in this case, what happened or what could happen as a result of a cyber attack? Well, the cyber attackers could break into the system and the details of how they break into the system are really not important. But let's say they were able to break into the system and obtain remote control. Then all you need to do is override the high pressure shutdown, override the pressure indications and alarms so that the operators can't tell what's going on with the system, uh, override any other indicators that flow has stopped, like low flow alarms, and once you've essentially blinded the operators to what's going on, then you close the downstream isolation valve. And after you close the downstream isolation valve, you wait, you wait, the pressure builds up in the downstream piping, and then overpressure, 
rupture, explosion, fire. And as I've mentioned, this has already happened. But it shouldn't have happened. And now I'm not going to even talk about the cybersecurity aspects. I'm going to talk about the failures in process engineering that allowed a cyber attack to result in this type of loss of containment. Okay, so let's first go back and look at what is traditionally done uh, to make sure that a uh, process plant is designed safely. And that's going to be the process hazards analysis process. We've been doing PHAs for more than 50 years. Uh, HAZOP, the Hazards and Operability Study, is the most common method for doing uh, the process hazards analysis. And when you do a HAZOP, you're going to take your entire facility, you're going to break it down into sections, into nodes, and then for each node, you're going to look at every deviation, like high pressure, low pressure, high flow, no flow, low flow, reverse flow. And for each one of those deviations, you're going to determine what could possibly cause that deviation to happen. And if it can happen, what are the consequences and what are the safeguards that are available to prevent that deviation from turning into the consequence? So as an example, you might have a high pressure scenario that we look at in the worksheet that you see here. And the cause of that deviation could be the motor operated emergency isolation valve fails to the closed position. Now, uh, in this particular case, it doesn't matter how, whether it's a cyber attack or just an inherent uh, random hardware safety failure. So the consequence of that situation is noted in the possibility of overpressuring the downstream piping. And then you see a relatively severe or high uh, consequence severity and a, a, a relatively high, uh, or I'm sorry, a relatively low likelihood because there is a safeguard. And in this, in this case, the safeguard is a SIL2 and which means uh, less than a 1% chance of failure of this device when it's called upon to act. So there is a high consequence, but the likelihood of the cause is not that high. The safeguards are highly available. And it was determined in this case that the uh, risk was tolerable the way the system was designed. But this methodology, the traditional methodology for doing a HAZOP, only considers random hardware failures. It doesn't consider the fact that things can be deliberately caused, things can be deliberately bypassed, which is where SPUR comes in. SPUR is going to allow us to modify this process for deliberate attacks. Now, a security PHA review or a SPUR is designed to either generate a performance target called a security level for cybersecurity or provide recommendations for inherently safe against cyber attack protection layers. It was developed by technical safety professionals who have a strong background in both controls, traditional process safety, and cybersecurity. And the key is it's designed to fit inside the existing plant life cycles. So the normal methods and procedures and tools that are used to analyze process safety are leveraged to include cybersecurity instead of trying to come up with a de dedicated cybersecurity study from scratch. The ultimate result of this will, again, either be a target security level in accordance with IEC ISA 62443 or recommendations on inherently safe safeguards. The flow of a security PHA review is to start by taking that PHA report, the HAZOP report, and you look at the initiating event and determine yes or no, is it hackable? Meaning, can a cyber attack cause the initiating event to happen? And to make a, a long discussion short, any initiating event or any safeguard that is in a computerized system, anything that has a microprocessor, whether that be uh, 
a, a safety PLC or a distributed control system, anything that has a microprocessor that can speak in router, routable protocol, we're going to assume it's hackable without worrying about the details of how the hack would actually be performed. That's not relevant to what we're doing in a spur. So if the initiating event is hackable, then we're going to look at the safeguards and look at each safeguard to determine if all of the safeguards are hackable. If either the cause is not hackable or any of the safeguards is not hackable, then the scenario is not hackable and it can't be caused by a cyber attack. So we don't worry about that scenario when we're setting cybersecurity levels. So if every if the scenario though is hackable, it's at that point in time that we need to assign a security level or recommend an inherently safe against cyber attack safeguard. So let's go back to that SPR uh, uh, of the uh, the HAZOP scenario that caused the accident at the oil pumping station. So when we do a spur of that HAZOP scenario, we see that the cause is hackable. Uh, a motor operated uh, emergency isolation valve is going to communicate through a distributed control system or possibly a safety instrument and system. In either case, it is a microprocessor based device that can be hacked. So we can make the valves go closed. And the safeguards, are all in a SIL2 rated safety instrumented system, which is also micro, microprocessor based and hackable. As a result, this entire scenario, the way it is currently designed, is hackable. A hacker can come in and deliberately cause this situation to happen. As a result, it is of high concern. So we can do two things. The first thing we can do is, well, we can we can look at the scenario and say the consequence is bad it's hackable so we need to assign an appropriate security level and the way you would do that is you would correlate the consequence of the event to the security level that you would choose so in this case a very high consequence for instance could result in a security level of three which is a very high level requirement uh, for cyber hygiene, cyber safeguarding. It's difficult to achieve and requires a lot of work. Of course, if we go down this route, we're gonna need our spy versus spy team to keep us safe, which maybe uh, we have very good cybersecurity, but from the process engineering perspective, from the HSE perspective, from the functional safety perspective, let's take a look at preventing this without using cybersecurity. So first off, the one thing that is absolutely inexcusable is that you could have made the design inherently safe against this scenario. What you see in this slide is a typical pump curve of a centrifugal pump. So as the flow rate through the pump get increases, the discharge pressure decreases. But what you'll notice is if you go all the way to the left to the zero point, there's a maximum head or a maximum pressure that this pump can be can develop. All you need to do is make sure that the discharge piping is rated to withstand that much pressure and this loss of containment explosion and fire cannot happen. And if you remember back to the picture of the pump station, we're not talking about 100 miles of piping that needs to be re-rated to increase its thickness. We're talking about a couple of meters. So that is the first and easiest thing that could have made that accident not happen. Other non-hackable safeguards that are active as opposed to uh, inherently safe in the PSM sense uh, are gonna include pressure relief. So on this slide, you see a variety of different techniques that are available uh, in order to make a, 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 a pressure relief happen through mechanical non-hackable systems. All the way to the left is a traditional spring-loaded relief valve. So if the pressure inside a vessel or at the discharge of the pump becomes so great that it pushes on the relief valve plug, uh, overcomes the force of the spring holding it closed, and it opens a pathway for the oil to be relieved, possibly to the surge tank, possibly back to the suction of the pump. 
Similarly, you have rupture discs, which once the pressure, uh, the set pressure of the disc is exceeded, it will simply rupture open and have a path for relief once again, either back to the discharge or to a catch vessel. And similar to the rupture disc uh, and the relief valve, it, all the way to the right is a um, buckling pin assembly. So in this case, uh, we have a, uh, a, a, a valve plug again, having the oil pressure pushed against it. And if the uh, design rating of the buckling pin is exceeded, it will deform and bend, opening a path to, for the oil to escape, all preventing the overpressure. Once again, this is inherently safe against cyber attack because you can't hack a spring, you can't hack a rupture disc, a piece of metal, or a buckling pin. Another non-hackable safeguard includes a, uh, a analog motor overload relay circuit. So when you, when you deadhead a pump, you are gonna cause the current going through the electrically driven pump to uh, overcurrent or undercurrent, and that's something that can be detect with, detected with a current monitor relay, which can then drive a contact to disconnect power from the pump. So uh, motor overload relays. And then finally, you can always, always mimic a safety instrumented function that's contained in a programmable safety instrumented system with an analog. So you take the same transmitter and uh, one part of the signal goes through the digital pathway through the PLC, but then you can also take that four to 20 milliamp current and go through a current monitor relay shown here as TSH100. And if the current uh, either goes too high or it goes too low, that's going to cause a, a, a contact to open, which will de-energize power. In this case, you're de-energizing the signal to a solenoid valve, but in our case, you would have de-energized the power to the motor contactor, which would disconnect the power from the motor, causing the pump to stop. Analog SIF mimics are always available for any safety instrument and function you can envision. Okay, so now if we take a look at this scenario after we consider some uh, mechanical safeguards through our spur process, uh, and in this case, we're using the tools in OpenPHA uh, that allow you to do a spur, uh, you see that the cause is hackable, yes. But when we look at the safeguards, the first cause or the first safeguard of the safety instrumented function is hackable, but an analog mimic would not be hackable. Mechanical pressure relief valve would not be hackable. Motor overload relay system would not be hackable. And since at least one of the safeguards is not hackable, the scenario as a whole is not hackable. Now, does that mean we don't need to do anything? Does that mean we don't need cybersecurity? No, that's not what that means. Because a hacker is always going to be able to shut down the plant. So some degree of cybersecurity is always going to be necessary. But what we want to make sure of is that if there's a high consequence loss of containment event that we can prevent with other means beyond cybersecurity, we want to at least consider those alternates. And if we don't implement them, that's gonna drive a higher security level or a higher degree of cybersecurity being required. So in terms of security PHA review, the overall benefits, uh, it does result in your risk being decreased to a tolerable level by lowering the consequences of the event. It also gives you a better understanding of the attack vectors. It goes through your plant, your process design, and identifies the, the vulnerabilities of the plant as opposed to the vulnerabilities of the control equipment to try to figure out what the pathway is to make an attack happen and make sure that that attack can't happen. It allows you to make the right choices for the design you have. And the right choice might not be related to cybersecurity. It might be related to mechanical or inherently safe design. It's a lot more efficient than other methods because it's going to extend 
an existing study instead of starting from scratch with a new type of study. And uh, it builds standards compliance by building on recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices for process hazards analysis. Now, all of this stuff is going to be described in a lot more detail very soon from ISA. There's an ISA book called Security PHA Review coming out soon. And there will also be an associated online uh, and live training class on how to perform security PHA reviews. So keep your eye out for that on the ISA website and also uh, the Conexus website will also have information on what's going on with ISA and other activities. Thank you for your time.